What's new for your garden home? Step inside this plant show place and find out. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about garden design that helps us see new opportunities for blurring the lines between the indoors and the outdoors. Now, in today's show, we're at a marketplace for new plant introductions, and I'm looking for some of the best new varieties for The Garden Home. And as you can see, this show will be full of lots of color. Now, I don't want to give away all the surprises, but here are just a few of the beauties you'll be seeing over the next half hour. Plants like heat-tolerant gazanias, these exotic geraniums, and breathtaking blooms that remind us of Camelot. Now let's get started right over here on this table where we can talk about one of my favorite plants, coleus. Take a look at this new twist on an old favorite. This is coleus, but not like the shade lovers your grandmother grew. These coleus are a part of a series called the stained glass works, and they can take the sun. In fact, the more sun they get, the more colorful they are. Let me share with you a knockout for the summer garden. This is coleus stained glass works needlepoint. Needlepoint has lacy looking leaves. Just look at that. You can't beat these deeply serrated leaves in green and white with a touch of rose. Now these coleus are so easy to care for if you'll just follow a few basic tips, such as plant them in full to partial sun. You'll want to space them anywhere from 12 to 24 inches apart, depending on the variety, and always in a humus-rich soil. Now you'll never want these plants to dry out because it's difficult for them to recover, so water them often enough to keep the soil consistently moist, but not soggy. As with most annuals, you'll want to feed your coleus every two weeks or so during the active growing season with a complete well-balanced fertilizer, such as a 20-20-20 formula. Now to encourage branching and increase bushiness, you should pinch back the tips. You know, coleus reminds me of a rich tapestry, like these medieval ones in the tapestry room at the Biltmore Estate in Asheville, North Carolina. I visited there one holiday season. Now as you look at some of the new plants in garden centers this year, consider them for two reasons. First, for using them in the garden, and second, as inspiration for decorating the inside of your home. I know I'm often inspired by plant colors, textures, and blooms when I'm looking for paints and fabrics. Just look at these dazzling flowers. I just love the color combination of this soft yellow and soft orange. These are Cape Daisies, or Osteospermums, and they come from the Crescendo series. Now, what's interesting about this plant is they'll take high temperatures, but they need dry air. So they're perfect for parts of California and in the Rocky Mountains. Not a particularly good plant for the south or areas where you have high humidity. I love Osteospermums in big banks or drifts and in containers. Some heat tolerant plants that are winning fans from coast to coast are these Kiss Gazanias. And hey, with a name like Kiss, you can expect to fall in love with this gorgeous variety's large daisy-like flowers. When growing Gazanias, keep in mind that they like to be planted in full sun. The soil should be moist, but well drained. While Gazanias prefer moist soils, they're actually quite drought tolerant. Space the plants six to 12 inches apart and feed them monthly with a well-balanced fertilizer. Want more for summer? Take a look at this. Summer shade wouldn't be the same without impatience, and my garden certainly wouldn't be the same without New Guinea impatience from the Sonic series. Just look at these called Magic Pink. I love them because the petals are striped. You have pink and white contrasted with one another on these big blooms. And what about these brand new Extreme Impatience, ideal for mass plantings? The New Guinea impatience were introduced in 1989, just that recently. 
and patients are a part of a large family of over 500 plant species. And they go by some funny names like Busy Lizzie and Touch Me Not. One can assume that it got its name in patients because it's indeed impatient. The slightest touch will cause the ripe seed pods to pop open. And did you know that impatients are one of the top selling bedding plants in the U.S.? They're just hard to resist. These little charmers are easy to grow, provided they're planted in a location that receives filtered light or partial shade. Although today's varieties are more sun tolerant than older varieties, too much sun will cause them to have small, even burned leaves and few blooms. And what do we have here? Just take a look at these. These are exotic geraniums, a new series of that old classic geranium we all know and love. Now this one's called Graffiti Fire. Just look at those gorgeous scarlet blooms. And this one, well it's called Graffiti Salmon Rose. Besides those really unique flowers, there's foliage with interesting patterns, such as dark bands or zones on the leaves. Now over the years of using geraniums, I've discovered that certain ways of caring for them can actually help improve their performance. For instance, when it comes to feeding, particularly in containers, I like to use a liquid fertilizer that's high in phosphorus, like 15, 30, 15. This will help promote blooming. You see, phosphorus is the middle number on the fertilizer label. Since constant watering can wash out or leach nutrients from the soil, I feed mine regularly, at least every two weeks or so during the growing season. This encourages them to set plenty of flower buds. I've also found that geraniums prefer cooler temperatures, so I give my plants only morning light and protection from hot afternoon sun. You see, too much heat will rob them of their vigor and keep them from flowering. Now moving right along, ivy geraniums are excellent for containers. Just look at this one called Holiday Ruby Dream. I just love the variegated flowers, and boy, this one's a real performer. Beautiful for cascading out of baskets and window boxes. Oh, and don't forget about Tutti Frutti. You'll be captivated by its blooms of dark pink with a magenta center. What eye-catching, one-of-a-kind color. Because the weather can be so unpredictable, the flowers we plant in our gardens have to be tough and resilient. Creating new varieties with these qualities in mind is exactly what's going on here in Germany. For instance, these are ivy geraniums and they represent some of the best in breeding. And Gary Falkenstein from the Flower Fields tells us more. Besides the two primary trial sites here in Europe, uh, northern Germany uh, for cold and wet, and southern France where we get a much warmer climate and a lot more sun, we have three primary sites in North America, in New Jersey, Colorado, and in British Columbia, giving us again three cross sections of trials. Why do you think the ivy geranium will become more popular in the United States? Well, I, I think uh, for one part, the cascades and blizzards are, are very heat tolerant and they're carefree. Um, and if they're planted in a container, which container gardening is catching on so much now in the United States and in Europe, uh, they're really virtually maintenance free and they'll give you more color in about any, any plant there is. I know the ivy geranium has been a mainstay in Europe for years. How does it size up to the American market? The double flowered ivies in North America are extremely popular and, and I think it's mostly by the way the grower grows them and presents them. They want to grow them in these large hanging baskets, take them to the retailer and then the customer buys them in this manner. When they try to grow these cascades, the singles, they, they shed their flowers, they're self-cleaning. And this is a problem for the grower because it falls on the crops below and by the time he delivers it to the retail, the flowers are gone. Uh, on the contrary, over here in Europe, where they really understand the differences in the varieties, the gardener goes after these cascades in very small pots, four inch and five inch pots. They plant them in a garden, they're very vigorous, and in no time at all they're full of color. A good example on the cascade and blizzard types in Europe, over 400 million are purchased every year. Really? In the U.S., about four million only. Well, we have a long way to a catch long up way with to them. catch up, a long way to when catch up. When you drive through Europe, one of the most beautiful aspects of these wonderful villages and towns are the window boxes. And a big part of the window box is the ivy geranium. That's correct. That's correct. In fact, I think most all the window boxes I've seen as I've gone through Europe, Bavaria, Switzerland, are the cascade and blizzard types. And they're, they're just totally carefree. 
So if Americans want to bring that charm to their gardens and add window boxes to their home, certainly the ivy geranium would be a perfect choice for that sort of composition. Perfect choice, perfect choice. When I look for flowers for my garden, particularly the summer garden, I want lots of big, bold color, lots of flower power. And I've certainly found that in this series called the Magellan series of zinnias. They come in a wide range of colors. Some of them are actually variegated, but the solid colors are creamy yellow, scarlet, and this beautiful pink. Now what's great about them is that you can cut them and bring them indoors and enjoy them in a beautiful bouquet. These can go from combination planters and window boxes to garden beds. These little beauties are gonna look great in containers in my garden this summer. These are Calibracoas, and they're a part of the Colorburst series. Actually, these are new varieties, part of the Colorburst Pro series. There are four different colors, this blue, this beautiful rose, red, and white. Now, one of the aspects of Calibracoa that I like so much is that they're a fairly low maintenance plant. You see, you don't have to deadhead them as you do some varieties of petunias. Just plant them in full sun after the threat of frost and they'll reward you with these blooms until the first cold days of fall. Now an eye-catching bloom that I have to show you here at the marketplace is Phlox, which you may not realize is a North American native wildflower that's been hybridized into some stunning varieties. Susan Shelley with the Flower Fields introduces us to a new variety with some tremendous improvements. Look at the color of that phlox. And it's quite something, isn't it? It caught my eye all the way across from the other side of the greenhouse. Well, she's got her own uh, built-in battery, I think. Now, the aroma I'm smelling, is this coming from this phlox? Mm, oh, yeah, yeah very that sweet. That is wonderful. Now, the name of this one, what is it? This is Phlox paniculata nikki. So, summer phlox, a new summer variety. Yep. And mildew resistant. Really? Yes. Because that's always been the trouble with the flocks that I've grown it's is that you can nemesis. get you can get the powdery mildew. Absolutely. And this one is much more resistant to that. As you can see, it's clean. Oh, and she is just fantastic. You know, this is one of the great old-fashioned perennials. My grandmother and great-grandmother had summer flocks in their gardens. There are such beautiful varieties of this. Um, some old, newer ones are improving them all the time. And I love to use these in a summer border. They are oh, just no. the mainstay of the summer border. You know, Susan, what's so interesting is when I lived in England and studying gardens, mm -hmm. so many of the great herbaceous borders where they, were, where they were just full of perennials had summer flocks in them. It's indispensable, it really is. And, and it's a North American native plant. It comes from our shore. Well, I even love the natives. We see them out in Pennsylvania blooming on the roadside in the early spring, and they're just gorgeous one of our most outstanding native plants. It really is, and it's, I guess it's lent itself well to hybridizing. <laughs> yes, certainly, by the looks of Nikki here. This is one of my favorites. These are just terrific performers. But I gotta smell this one more time. Mm. Oh, too fine, it. too I fine. Love. Well, thank you for introducing me to Nikki. You're quite welcome. Who doesn't love the fresh face of a daisy? Now this actually isn't a daisy, it's an argoranthemum. And this variety is called Sole Mio. And I just love its fresh, clear yellow color. Plant breeders have been working overtime to solve a common problem with argoranthemums, and that's poor branch development. You see, these new varieties are improved in a way that they produce more limbs and branch more frequently. And this helps keep the plant from splitting apart. <laughs> I'm always knocked out by the vast array of colors and new varieties of plants you can find at a showcase like this. Just look at this Prophet series of mums. What a great way to bring color into the fall garden. Take a look at this beauty. This is called Madeline. I love the soft lavender color, but if you look a little closer, the flowers themselves are outstanding. They look like little stars, and each of the little petals are shaped like spoons. Now, if you really like that rolled petal or spoon petal shape, you ought to take a look at this one. It's called Mariah. I love its beautiful golden color. 
If you're into a more daisy form mum, you might try this one called Sunny Camille. Besides the shapes of petals, the latest addition to this garden mum selection is a new line called Classic Inside Out Plants, which brings us the best of two worlds. These plants can be enjoyed inside as potted plants and then moved outdoors into containers or the garden. Now that's a plant that truly brings the home and garden together in a wonderful way. Just the idea behind the garden home. All of these garden mums here are named after women. In fact, a few years back, I attended the Barberton Mum Fest and got to see hundreds of varieties in beautiful display gardens. It's an event that's been going on since the early 80s, and it's a beautiful way to bring this community together. I had an opportunity to speak with an organizer about the work that goes into creating this event. Lisa, what better way to kick off the fall season than with a mum festival? Well, it's my favorite time of year, and I look forward to this every year because of this beautiful display that we do well, here at our lake. It really brings the crowds out. We have 30,000 people here sometimes on a nice weekend. Now, how many mums would be planted here at Anna Park for the Mum Festival? Uh, 17, 18,000 mums, creating over a million mum blooms. Oh, how wonderful. There's nothing like the beauty of flowers to bring people out. What's unique about this entire display is that most of the varieties here are named for women. Well, you can find all the girls here. There's Robin, Marilyn, Beth, Connie, even a Helga. Yes, all the Yoda varieties are named after women. Uh, we have a few varieties that are introduced from cooperating breeders that are not. And it works out very nicely. Uh, we see the mothers and the grandmothers, they bring their children and they put them right next to the sign and sit them down there and take a picture of them and that then they get their pictures titled. <laughs> in fact, I just made a, met a young lady this morning. Her name was Nicole and I said, oh, we have a Nicole over in the garden. She said, yes, I know. You know, the whole name and flower association is a lot of fun, but it's important to remember that mums are a great way to extend color in our gardens well into the fall. What characteristics do you look for in the design, as it were, of the flowers themselves? I think we're always looking to expand on uh, the total color range, whiter whites, yellows, corals, more salmon colors. You have a variety uh, originally like Bravo, for example. Bravo was one of the first better reds that we produced, but Bravo faded very rapidly. So how do we get something that's early in the season and that, that will give us a beautiful red color and hold that color? Hold the color, right. So now we came along with Helen which uh, holds its color a lot better. And uh, today, Helen is our number one selling variety. If you know me, you know I love the color blue, purple, and lavender. And that's what attracts me to these wonderful asters. Just look at this one. It's called Celeste. Look at that incredible purple-blue color. Perfect for the fall garden. Give it a lot of sparkle. But I want to show you a new introduction. This one called Melody is so gorgeous. And if you look at it from the side, you can see how the petals are actually stacked or layered, which gives this aster some real pizzazz. You know, asters are a great way to bring the gardening season to a close. I think they're outstanding, planted with other perennials, such as goldenrod. The plant breeders here at the marketplace tell me that the colors don't fade as easily with these new asters as they did with the older varieties. These are also excellent for indoor-outdoor gardening as part of the perfect inside-out program. You can use the asters as potted plants, then move them out into the garden to be enjoyed. And if you haven't guessed, asters are a great companion to some of the profit garden mums. Asters are an important fall-blooming perennial, and they come in a wide range of colors, from snowy white and smooth lavender, all the way to hot raspberry pink and soothing shades of blue. In the landscape, mature asters can range from two to four feet in height. When I design containers and flower beds, I'm always looking for plants that add drama. Verbenas almost always do the trick. They add a cascading element in a container composition and look lovely mingling among other annuals in the flower border. Jack Williams of the Flower Fields tells us a little bit about mixing things up with verbena. Well, you know, verbenas are what we consider annual plants. So that means they're flowers that we'll find in the garden center, usually in the spring around Mother's Day, be able to take them home. And it doesn't matter if you're in Minnesota or Florida. These are 
fall, summer, they're going to bloom. Now, because they are annual, they're not going to live over for the next year, and especially in those colder northern climates. But again, spring, summer, fall, you'll be enjoying that color, and they'll just keep producing. Now, one of the things I love about the verbena is that because there are so many colors, you should be you know, happy playing with the colors in the garden together. We can take and combine things to get very soft pastel type colors. Or if you really want something bold and bodacious, let's put those dark hot colors together with the light and really make a statement in that garden. So, you know, you need more than one verbena. If you want to turn heads in your garden this spring, well, you've come to the right place. Let's take a look at some of the new plant introductions for spring. Spring just wouldn't be spring in my garden without lots of penny violas. Just look at all of the colors to choose from. Red blotch, white jump up, yellow blotch, yellow frost. With large rounded blooms on neat tidy plants, these are hard to beat for both borders and in containers. Penny violas are just as cold hardy and more heat tolerant than many pansies, and they'll bloom profusely during the cool fall and spring months. If you're really into fragrance, this is one plant you have to have for your garden. This is a Nemesia, and all of these come from the Sachet series. There's a wide range of colors, peach, white, purple, but a new variety that actually cascades. You can see this one's more upright, but this new one called Berries and Cream will spill over the edge of containers. Isn't this a little charmer? Not only do they look great, but they have a wonderful fragrance, hence the name Sachet, like the fragrant pillows. Now another winner that I've discovered at this marketplace for new plant introductions is Thunbergia, named after the botanist Thunberg. It's easy to care for with no serious pest problems and the vines produce blooms that really show off in full sun from summer to fall. But don't take my word for it, here's Jack Williams to tell us more. Well another one of our plants, Thunbergia, has the common name Black Eyed Susan. But you can see this is no black-eyed Susan that we've seen before. This wonderful new kind of lavender flower with the beautiful dark eye in it. This is one called raspberry smoothie. And if you, if you could even feel these leaves, you just feel how wonderful it is. It's soft and fuzzy, both on the leaves and also on the stems. We think of trailing or vining plants as something that's gonna trail down. But what's great about these is that the stems will grow They'll twist around and grab onto things, allowing them to grow up so they can, well, they can grow as big as this, which is fantastic for putting it on pergolas or on your arbors. Just really make a great statement in the garden. The legend of Camelot lives on in the garden this spring through this colossal new variety of foxglove or digitalis called Camelot. Now it comes in four different colors, this soft lavender pink, rose, white, and cream. These plants have been designed to give us more reliable first year flowering and second year bloom. One great thing about foxglove is that it adds height and structure to the home garden. And Camelot is no exception, with a height of three and a half to four feet. So if you're looking for a tall, statuesque plant to put at the back of the borders to grow with maybe old fashioned roses or other perennials, you really ought to give this foxglove a try. Well, that's it for today's show. I hope you're now as excited as I am about some of these new varieties of plants. They truly are outstanding. And I hope you've come away with some ideas that you can use in your own garden home. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at pallensmith.com. On an upcoming episode of P. Allen Smith's Garden Home. Foods fresh from the garden are helping us blur the lines between inside and out. Join us as we visit chefs to learn their secret recipes. We'll also put together a daffodil arrangement and discover how you can help these beautiful flowers rebloom. Delicious foods and beautiful plants. Who could ask for more?